Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Owen, and this is Bruce, and we're going to do, be doing this webinar on projects and assessment. What's this webinar about, Bruce? Right. Well, um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to take you through a few things. We're going to talk a little bit about how to approach assessments, specifically with the digital technologies in mind. We're going to give you some resources to assist with um, task design and review and improvement processes, and we're going to focus a little bit on some of the thinking around constructing effective rubrics for digital technologies and some of the challenges that, that you may have with that. We do want to make sure that anyone who joins us throughout contributes, so if you've got your mic on and active, that's a, that's a great way to, to get involved. Um, and that's really it. We want to make this as, as useful as we can to you and to those of you who join uh, the video later on and watch the recording, Hopefully you'll get some some value out of it. Feel free to reach out to us on Twitter uh, and uh, via email using the help at aca.edu.au address if you've got any questions or specific things you want to follow up with us later on. Okay, so one of the things that we'd like to start with, and this is an activity that we think is always worth doing if you're going to begin these conversations at your own school, is to think about uh, two things. First of all, why or how we ensure learning is measured and improved when we undertake assessment of students. And we wanted to know a little bit about some of the assessment strategies you're currently using in digital technologies. And so, um, yeah, we'd use the chat window for that with uh, a number of people here, but we've got Scott there on the mic as well as ourselves. And I think one of the things that I would, um, I'll contribute before we, we throw it out is that um, yeah, at the moment for assessment or prior to starting in my role at the ACA, I relied very heavily on projects. Um, we did a little bit of formative stuff in class on classroom activities that were sort of much more structured. But I was a big believer in once students having uh, gotten on top and grasped the concepts that we wanted to explore, giving them that opportunity to explore those concepts in, a, in an area or in a um, topic that they found interesting. So for me, most of those strategies relied on designing projects that allowed for that exploration, but still had enough depth and rigor in them to ensure that you were able to determine how, how effectively students had learned those concepts. Um, so that was really the focus for me. Um, and so that really did require some very careful design of assessment tasks. And that's going to be the focus of um, what we're presenting today. So, um, Scott, did you have anything you wanted to, to throw out there in terms of both of those topics? Yeah, in a similar boat, I guess. Um, for our, us at our college, um, from year nine onwards, um, digital technologies is an elective. Um, so making sure that assessment is um, engaging enough that students continue on with it as an elective subject um, yeah, certainly in a cohort where we've got a cohort of 70 students, it's certainly um, like a challenge to make sure that we uh, have assessment that's engaging enough to can like attract students to stay in the subject. Yeah, right. And so you said a cohort of 70, is that the whole year group or is that how many you've got doing digital technologies? It's a cohort of like in year nine, we have 70 students in total. So. Oh. Uh, out of that, we've got um, 14 kids uh, in Year 9 Digital Technologies, for example. Yeah, right. Okay. And that's kind so, of the magic number. You need 14 to run your subject, so. Yeah, yeah, that sort of 15 or number around that is, is typically the number in most schools. So, yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge, and I think we're going to start to see that change a little bit over time as we get more and more um, schools doing some compulsory stuff. So I assume your school's now at the point where um, up to year eight, they're doing it compulsory? Yeah, so it's a term rotation um, across all elective areas. So year seven, they have digital technologies for one term. Um, and then again in year eight. Right, okay. So then that, and that aligns with roughly the amount of time that's been designed in the Australian curriculum. How many hours a week? um they have three 50 minute sessions all right so yeah it's probably it's it's going to be close to the number of hours that have been written in the curriculum which is which is a good thing because that's not always common around schools in the country so yeah all right well um what we'll talk about briefly uh for those of you who are joining us on the video uh some of the assessment principles that we are sort of going to be assuming and thinking about as we, we have this discussion 
the first is that we want to make sure that all assessment um, both monitors and assesses individual student achievement. So the idea of assessing both for and um, of learning is definitely in there. And assessment as learning is something that we do want to build into the, the projects that we design. So we'll talk a little bit more about that down the track. We want to make sure that every assessment that we put together allows every student to demonstrate their knowledge. And so that includes the students who are struggling with the material and those who are really sort of knocking it out of the park. And then I think the one that we often see when we're, we're looking at resources that people have been put together that can vary is the question of assessment being valid and reliable. So it's very easy to use an existing task that you might have or tweak an existing task, but you've always got to ask yourself the question, is it assessing what I intend to assess um, with the, the particular task that I've set? And then the other question around reliability is that if you were to mark that same task again, or if you were to pass that task on to someone else with the same marking key, um, would you get a consistent result? And I'm, I'm not talking that it needs to be mark for mark exactly the same, but you know, if you're going to say that that student has really got a good understanding of how, say, if statements work, then everyone who marks that piece of work should come to the same conclusion. And I think that's one of the weaknesses that I often see when people put their marking criteria together. And it's the reason we've decided to spend a little bit of time on rubrics at the end of this. Uh, and finally, the assessment should really be evidence driven. Uh, we often see that the students who are more disruptive in class tend to get lower marks and the students are less disruptive because it's a little bit of a sort of unconscious bias that teachers can have when they do their assessment, uh, when they do their marking. So we really wanna make sure that all of the evidence that we are asking students to present is very, very clear, that it's very obvious what they're, they're needing to put together. And that evidence should really drive everything that we do in terms of the, um, the assessments that we develop. And that includes uh, review of assessment as well. So um, after you deliver an assessment item, you really should be looking over that item, taking into consideration how students perform and use that as evidence to adjust or to revisit and um, review the, the tasks that you put together. So, we want to make sure that all of our tasks do these seven things and for the purposes of all of the discussion that we do have and if you're going to have these discussions with your staff at school, we really want you to have these things at the forefront of your mind each time you, you engage in these discussions. We want to make sure that the assessment task uh, provides feedback to students in terms of both um, how they feel as they progress through the task. And then when you eventually assess it and hand their results back, it provides some feedback at that point as well. So there's, there's quite, a, quite a bit of um, thought that needs to go into your design at that point. We wanna make sure that we actively involve students in their learning, which draws back to, to the comments that Scott made earlier about you know, wanting to engage students and keep them excited. Um, that, that links to number four there too, motivating students to want to learn. We wanna make sure that all of our assessment tasks inform our future practice, both in terms of what the task looks like the next time it's delivered, but also how we then can change the way that we teach whatever it is that we're teaching uh, in the future. So if students are performing very badly on a specific concept or in a particular area, then that is potentially an indication that you haven't taught that as effectively as you could. And that's something that we want you to be really thinking about. If you can clearly identify weaknesses or strengths in a cohort and link that back to the pedagogy you've used in the teaching of the concept prior to the assessment, then that's going to be something that you'll find valuable as a teacher that makes the task far better for you than it would be if you weren't able to do that as effectively otherwise. Um, going back to what we mentioned about valid and reliable assessment tasks. The best way to do that is to make sure that your criteria for students is explicit and measurable. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. And also we wanna make sure that there are opportunities for students to evaluate their own learning and to reflect on their learning at some stage, at least once I would say regularly throughout the process of completing that project. So you need to build that into the task and if you don't, then 
you know, some students will actually just see it as jumping through hoops to get the grade at the end. And that's particularly the case as they get older and, uh, you know, looking for marks that, that will ultimately lead to getting their ATAR or whatever it is that they're after. Um, Post-school, we really want to sort of make sure that it's not just seen as ticking boxes, that there are opportunities for students to think about all of those aspects as they move through. And um, well, finally, happen, just right? drawing back on that last thing, we want to make sure all students can, can achieve at some point. And that doesn't mean making the assignment easier or anything like that. It just means making sure that no matter which student is completing the task, they're able to demonstrate what it is they know. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone has to get an A, it's just that you should have no doubt whatsoever by the end of um, the assessment period that students have been able, to, uh, where every student is because they've been able to demonstrate that. So Owen, you're about to say something. Oh uh, yeah, I was just gonna, on number six, what kind of things can you do uh, to make, what, what sort of does that look like in terms of the self-evaluation and what opportunities can you give students to reflect on what they've done? So a couple of ways to do it. The first would be to ensure that you, in your instructions to students, have them refer back to previous work in the stage. So if you can think of the process as being a sort of designing or, or coming up with requirements for a project that they might be building, say a game, um, defining exactly what that game is going to look like and then putting that design in place, making sure that they're constantly going back to their original um, requirement specification or their initial designs and iterating over that and reviewing that and getting them to think about whether or not that's something that's still viable or not. So you can build those kinds of processes in. Some of the more kind of um, sort of hard linking back to assessment elements that you can do is have students complete um, the assessment rubric themselves as part of the submission process. I actually required my students to do that and on submission so they need to give me a completed version of the rubric where they rank themselves in terms of their learning um, and it's surprising actually they're usually much harder on themselves than I am so uh, it's definitely a worthwhile process and there's just a couple of really simple examples of ensuring that that self-evaluation reflection happens. I see that we've um, we've got another participant joining us Jenny and we've enabled your mic so if at any point you do want to contribute you can just turn your mic on um, of the toolbar at the top and feel free to feel free to throw some questions out there. We really do want to encourage some discussion and, and chats for various um, from participants throughout. So um, feel free to use the chat window as well. Uh, we'll. We'll be keeping an eye on that so that we can um, we can pick up on any questions or concerns. The other thing that um, I guess with some of the resources that have been put out to support teachers, we get a little bit concerned about is when a task attempts to assess the whole curriculum in one go. Um, the idea of a capstone project works with older students to some degree, but it can be very overwhelming for a student to have to essentially produce a giant project that assesses the whole curriculum. And so one of the things we really want to emphasize is that you plan to assess everything by the end of the year and that you give students lots of opportunities throughout the, the year to demonstrate their learning or the term or semester or whatever period you're working in. But um, ultimately, uh, you don't assess the whole curriculum in every task, you assess those parts that are best suited to the task of that type. And um, we'll, again, as we, as we talk about the design process of an assessment, we'll, we'll focus on sort of how to make that more manageable. So we're going to get you to do a little bit of a, an activity um, and we're going to keep it relatively brief. Um, in the handouts tab, which I'm sure you can all access, just um, have a check for us and hit us up in the chat window or, or Scott, just let us know. So you can definitely see the handouts tab there if you've got your mic on. Um, there's a... Yeah. Scratch maze game handout that you can see. Um, there should be a link to preview that and it'll open in the window. Um, this task has been written up on the basis of a year six task that's been delivered in the past that, that we're aware of. Um, the formatting goes a little bit strange in the, um, in, the, in the preview window there, but you can download it and we have all of four of those resources available for you to download. We'll be referring to all four of those documents throughout the webinar, so feel free to download them now. 
Um, but what we want you to do is to have a look at the Scratch Maze game. And we want you to ask yourself a few questions and share your answers to those questions in the chat. So the first is, how does the task provide opportunity for students to demonstrate their individual achievement? Does it have a low floor and high ceiling? How well do the retirement requirements of the task align to the content descriptions for the chosen year level? And this task is for a year six class, so you're looking at the year five, six band. And finally, how valid the task is. If you think the expectations that have been set in the task make it clear that we are actually assessing outcomes for that year, um, for that band level, that year five, six band. So um, we'll give you some time to look over it. What we might do so that we're not all sitting here in silence is we'll just quickly, I guess, um, talk through the assessment task, just run through it top to bottom. Um, and then we'll come back to the chat and we'll uh, um, yeah, pick up on any questions or we'll, we'll turn the mics on and, and have a bit of a listen, a bit of a chat about all of that. So, um, can we share the handout, Owen? How do we do that? Um, in preview, yeah, I can uh, upload it as a slide. I can I can just share my screen potentially. And, All right, let's um, do that. Um, yeah. Um, okay, let me do that. No, I have to. I haven't added the big marker extension yet. Um, what I will do is I will upload the file as a slide deck and then switch wow. back to the other slide deck. Um, so this is only our second time, I think, using Big Marker, but um, there we go. That looks good. So this task was put together as a, um, a task to assess just the digital technologies. Um, the reference there to the topic healthy, wealthy and wise was, I understand, to link it to the integrated studies unit that students were doing um, independently of digital technologies. So this isn't an integrated task as such. It's just using healthy, wealthy and wise as a thematic element um, for, for the game that students are developing. So um, it starts out with a little bit of a task to just get students uh, reflecting on what it is that they've learned in that healthy, wealthy and wise topic and how that might feed into the, um, the game that they're going to design. And it does that by asking them to write down some of the things they've learned about what is good or bad about those three topics. And then they've been given a set of rules for, for developing the game. So it's one player, it's a maze game, it fits the topic healthy, wealthy and wise. There's at least one enemy for each of the topics. There's a way to lose, which might be eating too much bad food, um, losing too much money or energy, colliding with enemies, getting hit by something from enemies, touching the walls of the maze, hitting obstacles, all the usual stuff you'd see in a game like this. Um, there needs to be a way to win, such as collecting all the items, escaping the maze or unlocking a door to get out, defeating the enemies or some combination um, or something else. There's a little bit of flexibility there for students. And the other thing is there only needs to be a single level, but you can make more if you want. You need to give the player their instructions for how to play and it has to have good sound effects, um, whatever that means. And then after students write down their ideas, they've been given a series of steps that they can follow that will help them in the in the process of putting the game together. Design the maze on paper, make the maze in scratch, make sprites for the player and the enemies and anything else, make the player move, make the enemies move, make the player die or get hurt when it touches the wall, make the player die or get hurt when it touches the enemies, make items get collected when you touch them by disappearing, and then make it possible to win. And then there's a little paragraph there on um, you might need to use if else or repeat until blocks in Scratch to, to make this happen. And then it gives you a rubric on the next page, which you can use to see how you're going and um, that the teacher will be using to, to mark your work. So that rubric will, will come to in a little bit more detail later on in the webinar. 
but it's there and I recommend you have a quick look at how that's been constructed as well as a bit of a think about the task. Um, and what we might do is, Owen, I might get your, maybe you can throw your thinking up in terms of how that's structured and then we'll, we'll go out to the teachers in the audience and see what, what they've got to say. So I'll let you take over the controls there if you wanted to flip through things specifically. Yep. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, it's it seems like quite a fun activity. There's lots of scope uh, for uh, kids who want to get really involved to really show that they're learning and make a really open-ended game. So it's really got some great scope um, for that. It's also possible for uh, for students who just want to make something finish and demonstrate that the, the things that they know um, quite effectively, which which I quite like. I like how it's sort of integrated with a particular topic or a theme that they can reflect back on to demonstrate um, the things that they know and it's scaffolded in a way that is uh, helpful but also is room for exploration. So yeah, I think it's I think it's quite um, I think it's quite well designed in that in that in that aspect. Um, having never taught a year five or six class before, I'm not sure sort of the expectations necessarily at that specific level in terms of what kind of amount of work and time that you expect them to put into these types of tasks. So I'd be interested to hear uh, Scott and Jenny's thoughts on that as well. Cool. All right. And I guess one of the things that I'm also interested to hear, hear about is, is how people think the language in that rubric would be in terms of accessibility for students, but also in terms of consistency for teacher marking. Um, one thing that I think it's a little bit weak on is it doesn't make it very, very clear explicitly in the rubric what the expectations around the programming actually is. So there's nothing there that says, for example, that you need to use an if statement, although it's implied because, you know, if your collision is going to trigger some kind of event, then there's going to be an if statement in there. But um, it's an interesting balance when you're working with younger students to um, make, make <coughs> sorry about that, make that language accessible and clear for them so that they understand what it is that they need to do without getting too technical or bogged down um, and make to make the, the rubric unwieldy or un for them to understand. Another thing that's interesting about the design of the rubric is it's not a standard table with the same number of rows and columns. You can see, for example, that enemy movement and collision programming have more levels, more tiers of understanding, if you will, that are um, that students might demonstrate, as opposed to the other criteria, which tend to have a high, a low, and a, and a middle. So um, we'll throw to the teachers. Uh, any any comments or or thoughts based on those those previous questions? Um, Owen, maybe you can throw that slide back up where we had the the questions we yep. wanted people to think about, um, and you can put those either in the chat um, or you can turn your mic on and, and share your thinking directly with us. Right. Yeah, it certainly, um, it certainly allows for a very high ceiling, I think. Students could run with this and spend all hours of their free time um, working on this project. So I think it it's certainly good for the students that really want to take this and, and run with it um, and gives them a lot of scope in terms of what they can do. It's certainly not um, constrained um, for those students. So in terms of having a high ceiling, um, yeah, it's certainly very high. Um, touching on the rubric, it's certainly different to anything, um, well, it's different to, to what I currently use in my, um, teaching. So we use the QCAA rubrics, which have um, pretty fluffy kind of terminology. So um, proficient use of whatever it might be or what they're looking at. So I assume they're looking at um, incorporating decision making, repetition and user interface design as their um, like the part of the achievement standard that they're assessing. And the standardized rubrics that we have um, from our you know, assessment body uh, certainly doesn't look like this. So this is um, a different way to look at it for me. Yeah, I think that that question on rubrics is something we'll return to. Um, it's something that comes up a lot. And I know we've had the discussion down here in the ACT quite, ex uh, quite extensively during our curriculum rewrite as well about the usefulness of rubrics that have the broad high level language in it. 
Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll provide you with a little bit of um, uh, advice on how you can take those, those broader statements and break them down into something that's a little bit more accessible to students. Um, any, other, any other comments you wanted to make, Scott, on the requirements or on the, the validity or expectations? Um, and Jenny, we'd, we'd love to hear from you if you've, um, uh, even if you, you don't have a mic there, you can throw your, your comments in the chat window. All right. Yeah, I think um, um, just having a look through the curriculum, um, like in a different tab, um, it's yeah. it's not like a, it's not explicit, but it's certainly implied where uh, like which content descriptors um, this assessment task relates to. Um, but I guess even at a year five, six level, I think using some of the language uh, from the content descriptor would help focus this um, to some degree. So I think at year five, six, um, we can start introducing students to terms like branching and iteration, um, or at least if then statements. Um, I try to err on the side of using the actual language from the curriculum. So we've got that common language from, you know, um, really year three to year 10. Um, yeah, it's a, you can see evidence of it, but um, perhaps it's not as um, explicit as some assessment tasks that other teachers might create. Yeah, yep. and, and I think that's a fair comment to make. Um, I, I, I'd be interested to know exactly how far along in the implementation um, phase this school was when they put the task together, because Clearly, if you've got students and you're using the language in class, then I, I have that expectation that language is then visible in the rubric. So I'm sure that there's a factor that, that could be contributing um, based on student experience as well. Um, but, but yeah, they're good thoughts and they're interesting. I see that we've got a comment from Nikki in the chat too saying, um, my optimism about getting good sound effects means that I'm living a little dangerously and that's, that's probably quite fair. Um, in fact, th those are the kinds of terms that I think are very subjective and they could prove problematic. So, um, you know, asking, telling students that the sound effects have to be good um, or not annoying and then trying to interpret that is, is going to be a real challenge. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it's, that, it's that question of balance when it comes to language. Um, it definitely is. So, well, Unless you've got any more comments, Owen, we'll move on from that bit. No, I think we can move on. Um, for those of you who are following along um, with the video, I recommend grabbing that document and spending a little bit more time looking at it um, yourself, just, just setting a bit of time, see what other conclusions you come up with. And like I said, feel free to, to send any questions or comments through to us by email. And if you're watching on YouTube, we'll put uh, links in the, in the comments in the, in the description of the video as well. Yeah, good, good. Thanks for that, Owen. So when it comes to designing tasks, I think the questions you want to start with are the following. Which content descriptions are complementary in your current teaching program? So particularly if you're doing integrated subject, uh, integrated programs in primary school, you've got an opportunity to look across multiple subjects and look for the commonality um, or, or, the, or the, the complementary content descriptions. One of the things that can be very hard is trying to mash too many different elements of the curriculum together. And really, the ones that fit together naturally are going to be more easily assessed together. So um, once you can identify those content descriptions that are complementary, selecting uh, the subset of those that you're going to assess in the task is going to be absolutely critical. And then um, the ones that you leave out potentially provide you with opportunities for informing future tasks or additional um, learning programs or changes to your learning program that you might you might change. So um, don't feel like just because they're complementary, they need to be incorporated into the task that you're designing immediately. Um, that could be something that you look for, look at in two or three iterations down the road. Um, but those are sort of the questions you start with to make sure that you are actually focusing in on the right things before you build your assessment. The other thing that you need to be doing is making sure that you're very, very clear about what students have already been taught and 
we mean what they've been taught explicitly. I mean, you may have taught things implicitly that some students will have picked up on, but others won't have. To make that a requirement of the assessment is a little bit unfair. So you really want to make sure that you understand what you've taught students um, through the learning program up to the point right now that you're going to be delivering the task. Um, the context in which those skills have been applied, because that has implications for particularly the students at the lower end, um, because they're more likely to be able to translate their understanding and their skills to a familiar or an already experienced um, context, whereas the higher performing students tend to be a little bit better at kind of um, same skills, new context or unfamiliar context. So it's really, really important that you, you get that balance right. And then finally, you need to be making sure that you've actually read the achievement standard so that you can get a sense of the expected level of, um, of performance that students should be able to demonstrate um, to, to be satisfactorily on top of what it is that they're learning in the curriculum. Um, that last part, the, the relevant achievement standard, I'm not saying that, you know, that's the top that you need to be pitching the, the assessment task at. So that doesn't describe the A or anything like that that you're looking for, but it's important that you understand what kind of, um, uh, what it is that students should be producing, um, the depth of understanding or the, you know, the level of mastery of the skills it is that, that, that they should be demonstrating by the end of the band. And remember, that's the end of the band. So if you're doing this with, if you're setting a task for students in the fourth week of year seven, and they haven't done any digital technologies before, factor that in, factor that into the expectations you're setting for the task. Um, so that all feeds into the, the following questions. How will your low performing students demonstrate their learning um, and how you're challenging the high performing students? That's that concept of a high ceiling, low floor. Um, making sure that there is scope for that to occur means making sure that there are clear differentiators in the task that will allow students to both demonstrate the basics and also show depth of learning and higher order thinking. And then there's that element of engagement and fun and motivation that you need to build into. And that's where drawing on what you know students are learning elsewhere can be really valuable. And I guess that would have been the thinking behind adopting the healthy, wealthy and wise topic. Even though that wasn't an integrated task for the scratch maze, it at least drew on something that students were obviously doing other activities around in their integrated studies unit. And so there's a good opportunity for, for that in the, the junior years in primary school um, in particular, but in high school, now that we've got a fairly standard curriculum um, across all of the year levels, you should be able to get a sense of what students are learning and talking to teachers and other faculties can give you an indication of what kind of things that, that they might be doing in other, in other subjects. When it comes to integration, we've got a, a separate handout um, that talks a little bit about some of our thinking around integration and the challenges we've put together. Um, the real risk with integrated content is that um, only one subject gets the attention it deserves. Um, the other subjects can often be covered in a very contrived or artificial way. And that's a common problem with a lot of the STEM, STEAM stuff that we've seen. Uh, we've seen a lot of stuff on the Twitter feed and through various sort of discussions with teachers where they say, yeah, we're doing a STEAM project and this is what we're doing. And when you really sort of look at it in a lot of detail, there's a whole heap of maybe ICT general capabilities and creative thinking and that kind of stuff in it. And that's great in terms of um, student developing capability in those general capabilities, but they often lack the depth of understanding that's expected across many of the subjects in, um, in the Australian curriculum. So, you know, being creative doesn't necessarily mean that you're learning a specific arts outcome or, you know, as a specific uh, engineering or design and technologies outcome as much as it applies for digital technology. So um, if you're going to do an integrated project, one of the things that is absolutely critical as a teacher is that you make sure you are knowledgeable around all of the curriculum areas that you are incorporating, at the very least around the content descriptions of those um, subject areas that, that you're planning to integrate. And so um, primary teachers who are teaching a lot of the curriculum and get their heads around 
all of the subjects to be able to deliver them effectively um, um, much better naturally at these integrated projects is what we found but in high school as the concepts become more advanced it's absolutely critical that um that you also make the effort to go through the process of actually um getting on top of these things so um Owen's jumped into the task design scaffold, which is the, the next task that we were going to do. And there was a slide just before that that I was going to um, run through. We don't need to because um, it's all that Bruce. That's OK. I'm just trying to remember what we had on that slide. But I think I've got it up in front of me here um, on another page. Yep, here it is. So um, what we're going to get you to do really is, um, oh, no, we changed the slide. Flick it back for me, Owen, just quickly, just so I can double check exactly what it was we were going to talk about before yeah. I jump back to the scaffold. Um, the concept of the document, I believe. That one. That's right. We're just going to go quickly over the, the document. That's it. So when you um, sit down with your staff, if you're going to, to use this document, you can flick back now, Owen. Um, if you're going to use yep. this document as part of an activity, you'll need a decent chunk of time to actually do this. Um, we're just going to cover it very, very briefly. What this scaffold is designed to do is to sort of walk you through the process of thinking about um, what you might need to consider when you're designing an assessment task for students. Um, the principles are really designed to assist you in making sure that you get that rigor in the task that you are definitely addressing what's expected from the curriculum and that you've actually thought about how the classwork that you've done and all of the, the learning students have done up to that point will feed into that particular assessment task. So um, the kinds of analysis questions we're talking about, uh, which content descriptions are being assessed, how um, you have taught those content descriptions in class, and we want you to be explicit about that. Actually, just provide a list of dot points for each of them saying, you know, we taught this by um, doing a ACA digital challenge that um, went through branching, or, you know, we um, we played the, um, you know, we, we did a B-Bot activity and we understood that you know, we could follow different series of instructions to get to the same point, but that they were all, the, all um, correct whatever it is that you've actually done, be quite explicit um, because that will help you when it comes to ensuring that the students who are at the lower end of achievement, that they can demonstrate what it is they know. And at the same time, it just ensures that when you're thinking about how to extend the, the higher end as well, you've got something you can draw on and you can say, well, how can I make that particular activity that we did more challenging or where would I have taken it if I, um, if I was going to, to do more with that? Um, look for the indicators then in um, capability or achievement that you saw in class. And again, use that to inform the design of the task. And then the other thing that you want to be thinking about is how the learning that you've identified maps to the achievement standard and how the learning intentions are reflected in those achievement standards. Um, because you will need to report on students at the end and you're going to use this assessment as part of the evidence for reporting and you're reporting against that achievement standard. So that relationship needs to be very explicit and very, very clear. Um, the other thing to draw on are those um, engaging topics and interesting um, experiences that, that your students have had. Remember that this can be drawn out of observations that you have, the way that students talk about things, their behaviours in class and the way they respond to various um, discussions and things like that. You're just looking for a hook. You want a way to, to get the students excited. And that's one of the reasons why I think assessment tasks are generally only good for two or three years with minor revision. If you see a significant change in terms of what students are getting excited about and what they engage with, then you know to, to keep them engaged, you're going to need to really think about how you know what currently um, is, is, is sort of feeding into their their um, what was the there was a term I remember my university lecturer using um, life worlds I think is the one that she used, but it's yeah you want to make sure that you're connecting learning to to, to the students' experiences, and so those can change quite rapidly. Um, nowadays. 
the we've got a whole separate document on um, integrated project considerations which i'm not going to spend any too much time with other than to say that they go through the process that we went through when we designed our digital technologies plus x challenges so there's an exhaustive discussion on how we selected for example the um, geometry content descriptions for our digital technologies plus geometry challenge and why we chose to do our digital technologies plus science challenge on the biology topic using the biology content descriptions on classification um, owen and i were the ones who, who put that together and we relied very heavily on the relationship between um, classification of species and the sort of yes no um, or present absent questions that you tend to consider when you're performing classification and we saw that as a good opportunity to link to branching and so that whole challenge was built on that idea that classification is a essentially a complicated branching activity um, and branching is a fundamental concept in computer science that's based on data and so yeah did you want to throw anything else out there owen on that and a, a point on that is we we actually chose not to cover the whole digital technologies content descriptions because we were integrating because we spent more time talking about the biology and getting uh, close to half of the time being explicitly teaching biology. We opted not to uh, teach iteration at all in the course that we really want would we just did branching and and user input in the course because we were focusing on that biology um, aspect and then we wrote an extension course to enable uh, students to do to extend and and to cover that uh, topic of um, iteration but um, you may not cover the entire content descriptions just in one or in, in integrated activities like that and that was what we found as well yeah and that's fine um, like we said before you are capturing or collecting evidence over a number of tasks that will inform your final grade that you apply on the basis of the achievement standard but just be aware that if, for example, you only do branching like we did, that you still haven't addressed the iteration aspect of the content description. And so a later assessment task that you do will need to incorporate iteration quite heavily. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the whole thinking that goes on about that. So um, that, that scaffold is there to assist you. And, you know, we've got the, the way you use the data that you collect from those previous questions to build that up. Um, we, we said just put together a draft task at this point, and I think that's critical. This is about getting an idea down on paper, not about sort of firming it up at this point, because once you get to the point where you're thinking about how you're going to assess this and doing rubrics and the like, you are going to want to revisit this um, process because there will be things that you decide you want to look for specifically in the task that you then need to write back into the design. So you don't have to get it exactly right at this point, but you do need to get a pretty good idea of what the task is going to look like, what themes it's going to follow, what you're going to assess um, before you, you progress any further through the task design process. Okay, um, let's see. We're, we're, we're running pretty good in terms of time. so. We're going to spend the last sort of 15 minutes focusing specifically on, on marking criteria and rubrics. And I guess um, we know that these are not used as commonly in um, the primary sector. Uh, but one of the reasons I think they're still valuable, or at least the thinking is still valuable, is that it they do give you a very um, clear way of thinking about differentiation in terms of the achievement that you observe um, and, and how students are um, uh, demonstrating what it is that they understand. So the whole point of using a rubric is to make sure the expectations are clear for students, um, that they are consistently applied by teachers and to assist with the provision of feedback because anyone who's done a whole lot of marking knows that if you know by the time you get to assignment number 50 of 60 um, if the only feedback students are getting are comments that student's not going to get the same quality of comment as the student that you did first um, unfortunately that's the reality if you break it up then you know that doesn't tend to happen as much but 
if you're trying to do 16 a day, then yeah, unfortunately, student number 60 often doesn't get as good a quality feedback as student number one. So rubrics give you a way of ensuring that there's at least a minimum standard of feedback and it allows you to focus your feedback on the things that students haven't done as well. At. It gives you a way of focusing some of that attention. And um, all criteria in your, achieve, in your rubric should map to achievement standards. That is absolutely critical. If you are not assessing what is in the achievement standard, when the achievement standard identifies what it is students are expected to perform to in terms of the standard, then um, you are not assessing the subject. Um, you're kind of potentially missing what it is that you're looking for. And often you find that a lot of things are included in these kinds of um, assessment criteria that are a bit more general capability like, and that's fine. But just because a student, for example, can use iMovie particularly well, doesn't mean they should get an A in digital technologies. Um, that is you know being able to use an application to produce something which is fantastic it's definitely um one of the more complicated things that a student might be expected to do under the ict general capability but it is not part of the digital technology subject therefore it doesn't really have a bearing on that grade um at least not in a general sense so when you are putting together your criteria for your rubric and i think this is where a lot of the kind of system level or very high level um, marking keys fall down. You must make sure that the language you use is measurable, that it is observable, that what you list, put in the rubric is observable, that the marking that you apply to that rubric is reproducible, that the levels between um, student performance are clearly distinguishable, and that the criteria are independent. And that last one can be really, really hard to get right in the development of your rubric. I often spend you know, a day or two alone just on getting the high level criteria right before I even bother filling in the stuff for the lower levels. And that's because one of the things you don't wanna do is preclude a student from being able to demonstrate the highest level of achievement against one criterion because it is too tightly coupled to another. Um, it's very, very difficult to get that right. And it often requires a couple of iterations. And I don't think it's a bad thing to accept that that is a real challenge. Um, when you know about it, you can work to, to eliminate that and to improve that down the track. So on the issue I mentioned before on criteria as feedback, one of the things that I think students should be able to, to do is they should be able to, when they receive the rubric after they've been assessed, they should be able to see how their task performance is reflected in the language in the key. So um, you, you know, they see that they got you know, the third level down for branching or something, they should be able to look at their task and see how it reflects exactly what that third level was all about. You know, maybe it says that um, the there's something along the line. Well, let's let's come back to it when I've got an example in front of me. But you want to make sure that that, that language is is clearly identified by the student as well. Um, you should supplement that with additional feedback, and this is particularly the case for students who are performing at the very high and very low end. Students at the bottom, in particular, need a lot of additional support to help them identify why it is they've missed the mark so much, and students at the top will want to know exactly how they've demonstrated those high level um, things and how they could potentially improve beyond that. Um, if you just sort of tick all of the highest levels and write good as your comment on there, then that student doesn't really know where to take that, where they can go to improve on it. And what we do know is that, you know, the, the standards and the expectations that we set for students um, are often exceeded by those students at the top and we don't really want them cruising their way through. We really do want them to be challenged by school. Um, and I mentioned before, one of the strategies that you can use to get students to reflect and to evaluate their learning is to present the rubric to them before they begin and to have them use it for self-assessment. And I really encourage you to do that. Um, I think that's absolutely critical for, um, for getting the most out of rubrics. So we've got a rubrics a designing rubrics handout as well. Um, and what I'm going to do here while Owen opens it up is I'm gonna get you to sort of just focus on one or two of the things that we mentioned. 
And I want you to think a little bit about that rubric that we saw when the previous scratch task. And I want you to sort of think to yourself, how could we improve that to make it a better rubric for um, the students and or for the teachers that would then be applying that. So um, when it comes to designing a rubric, um, what this document does is it takes you through the process of taking a large, very high level um, description of student learning and break it down or decompose it, which is, you know, a part of the digital technologies curriculum, decomposition of a problem, decompose it into smaller parts that can be more explicitly assessed. Um, there's an activity on the digital technologies hub called um, There Can Only Be One. It's a programming activity where students are writing a little program to count votes from an election. And there's some advice on assessment that gives a five point scale of um, what students might need to be demonstrating against the criterion of algorithm implementation. And the A description is algorithm implementation is well structured and minimizes repetition. Code deals with rare slash exception cases and is well documented. The E, uh, or sorry, the C by a comparison is can translate the main elements of the algorithm into code. System correct answer when data comments are added to the to explain steps. The E is attempts to implement the algorithm, but significant assistance is required to do so. Now those are very broad statements. There is a clear difference between that A, that C, and that E. That's no doubt whatsoever. But if we want to turn that into a marking key, um, for a student to read something like um, can translate the main elements of the algorithm into code and generate correct answers with common data, that that's extremely difficult. Um, particularly if you're thinking about a task that's being presented all of the levels and we look for the key criteria that are being captured by that. And the statement, that statement there, essentially talks about code structure, it talks about algorithm correctness, it talks about document algorithm design in terms of the control structures being used, which might include branching, iteration, and user input. Now, those seven uh, <laughs> curriculum. All right, it appears we might have lost Bruce. Um, so I'll just conti uh, continue talking. Hopefully he comes back in a second. Um, he was actually glitching out, so I'll just recap a bit what he said. So uh, looking at uh, making this rubric and identifying the criteria, um, the language in this rubric previously was not necessarily something that uh, students can easily translate and know exactly what they need to do just by reading um, the criteria. Um, and so something a bit more explicit in terms of um, the curriculum and uh, in terms of the algorithmic design, mentioning specific content concepts from the curriculum, and these are the things that will be assessed on, I think should actually be um, included in the rubric that, that you actually give to students. And this is a bit of a process that um, Bruce has written about um, how they went about uh, developing the rubric based on what the highest level of achievement is for each of these concepts and the lowest achievement as well. And it talks about doing it on a post-it note or some way of doing it physically to move them around and actually hone some of the language so that uh, it's crystal clear for students what they uh, need to achieve in order to um, uh, have an output in that uh, highest band. And there's code structure, algorithmic correctness, documentation, branching, iteration, and the uh, user input. And so these are the uh, concepts that they're, they're assessing in this particular example. Um, some, some, it's, it's quite interesting in terms of documentation where sometimes, say for example, if there's Python code in high school, sometimes uh, the comments 
Um, the code is almost essentially as simple as reading the comments once you understand the code. So um, appropriate levels of documentation, I think, uh, can be included as required. Um, and in terms of some of the uh, scratch activities as well, it, you notice it doesn't really mention uh, code complexity. So lots of scratch activities that you might see might have additional branches and additional code blocks um, that may perform the correct output, but may not necessarily be required in order to produce that, that required output at all. And so um, actually putting in your rubric that um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, al the algorithm was sold efficiently um, with as minimal code possible is actually a really good way to get students to think carefully about how they're writing their code as opposed to just uh, putting in lots of blocks until it um, finally um, does what, what the, uh, the task was specified to achieve. All right, welcome back, Bruce. Well, I have no idea what happened there. That's not supposed to happen when you get your end. Um, anyway, uh, don't know what you just said, Owen, but assume that you were you're talking about setting your criteria. The other thing that you do need yep. to, to think about is um, the language that you use. Um, so I heard I heard Owen just talking about efficiency then. Um, it's important that students understand what efficiency means. Um, we've seen examples in the past where um, efficiency hasn't really been applied um, from our perspective. Um, and in fact, looking at the code, it's unclear that the teacher really understood exactly what was going on. Um, so if you're going to use language like that, just be very, very careful. Um, we One of the things that that particular task was really emphasizing, um, the, the, the post-it note approach to constructing your rubric, is that you don't need to get too hung up on knowing exactly where you're going to set your criteria when you're doing this as a draft process. Just write each of the things you're looking for on a post-it note, stick it in the relevant um, section, and then as you add more and more things, you can start to you know pull, pull that post-it note off and put it higher or put it lower and move things around so that you can get a very clear indication of what that progression is going to be like. Um, so, um, once you've done that, you go through the process of doing final refinement. You, um, you know, read the text. You say, is it articulating exactly what it is that I want it to articulate? Once that's done, you revisit whether or not the language you're using is actually um, quantifiable. Is it observable? Is it distinguishable? All of those things we mentioned. You can start thinking about allocating indicative marks, which you might do particularly in senior years where marks are, are more important for rankings and the like. And then the other thing to consider finally is the language that you're using. Is the language accessible to the students and is the language accessible to teachers that aren't you? And will they make that same kind of interpretation that you have? So um, that's kind of all I wanted to say around this. Um, most of the uh, that, that, that activity is definitely worthwhile doing and you can grab a copy of that from the handout section so that you can do it. Um, the last thing we wanted to mention before we finish up the webinar is the, the work samples on the Australian Curriculum website. Now, the work samples have a couple of elements. There is the annotated work samples for all of the different levels um, and they have above, at and below standard. And then finally, the mapping to the achievement standards. Um, the mapping to the achievement standards is really just demonstrating which parts of the achievement standard each of the work samples addresses. So that sort of draws on what we mentioned earlier about not trying to assess everything at the same time. It's a good opportunity to see alignment of student work with the Australian curriculum, but there are some limitations. Um, one of the things that you really need to understand is that because the work samples are annotated, those annotations only identify what is present not what is missing. So um, you do really need to open multiple um, versions of the same uh, task so that you can see what the differences are between above, at and below because the annotations themselves can't sort of say this is missing and that's why it's not above standard or this is missing and that's why it's at standard. Um, you, you really do need to be able to sort of compare side by side. And the other thing is always keep in mind that 
tasks may not assess whole elements of that comp description. Um, and so you, they may require supplementation, which is one of the things we've really been emphasizing throughout. So um, they are a great resource. The, they've been moved so that they're accessible from inside the curriculum itself. You can just go to the band level of interest and then click on the, the relevant work samples and grab copies. Um, if that link's broken, make sure you let a car know um, because it wasn't working at one point um, for us when we were in doing some investigation. But um, having them right there in the curriculum is fantastic as a way of, of being able to access the work samples that are out there. So final slide is just a bit of a summary. I guess one of the things we want to emphasize is that assessment is really about ensuring students can demonstrate learning. We want the tasks that you develop for digital technologies to really use um, the student learning of the content descriptions against the achievement standards to, to get the level right. We want the language to be clear and explicit and we want your expectations to be clearly defined. Um, that really is what's going to make these things accessible to students to, to, to ensure that they are actually giving you what they want to demonstrate exactly what it is they understand. And finally, um, student performance on assessment needs to be informing your practice. If you uh, put together an assessment task and it tanks, it doesn't work particularly well, then you know what, that's fine. You just have to accept that and you need to incorporate um, the learning that you may be able to pick up from observing students after the, the task or anything else to, um, to, to adjust it for the, for the next time that you deliver it or to throw it away completely. If a task completely misses the, misses the um, bar by a long way, um, throw it out and start again. And I think as teachers, um, all of us have done that. I know I set a task once that was way too difficult and really did lead to um, uh, a lot of disappointed students. And that one got binned very, very quickly and I went back to the drawing board. And you know what? That's fine. Um, if we don't try these things out, then we don't get a clear picture of how students are, are able to effectively demonstrate what it is that they, they know and understand. So. That's it from me. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add, Owen, before we finish up, and we'd like to take last comments from um, from people if there's anything you wanted to, to say. Uh, not really. I think you covered it uh, very well, Bruce. Um, Scott, got any questions you want us to cover? No, nah, I think I'm pretty good, guys. That um, summed things up really well for us. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming and um yeah well uh i think we're going to be doing these webinars i believe once every fortnight now um if you feel like uh subscribing on our big marker um channel it seems like we'll be using that for the foreseeable future it's not blocked in queensland um <laughs> which is nice um and thanks for coming everyone yeah thank you and like we've been saying please reach out to us, help at aca.edu.au. Um, if you've got any questions at all, uh, we're happy to, to talk about all of these kinds of things um, as we, with people who are, who are interested and want to know more. So thank you. All right.